You know, the last, the last uh, three weeks we've been in this series where we're exploring, you know, how Christ enters into our lives and makes himself at home in our homes and in our relationships and, and in our own heart. And, you know, how we can welcome him in and, and, and what it means to live with him and, you know, the messiness of life. And today we are specifically, was dedicated specifically to looking at how Jesus enters into the messiness of our families and our family homes. And this is a, this is a timely word, you know, because a lot, of, a lot of us are getting together with family. And, you know, that always means that there's, there's stuff, you know, with anybody we're close to that we have a long history with, there's always stuff, right? And so um, this message is really dedicated to that. But about, about two and a half, three weeks ago, I started to prepare for this sermon. And, you know, I usually sit down and I begin to, you know, pray and reflect and, and something happened to me that didn't happen, has never happened before. And that is, is that all of a sudden I just started writing and um, what came out was not a sermon, but a story. And I feel like I need to be faithful to that. And I need to share this story with you. Um, it's a short story. It is, um, it's a true story. It is uh, something of a mystery story, uh, and there's some drama in it, you know. So, but it's also by the end. I hope that you see that it's a Christmas story too. Is it okay if I share this with you? Yeah. Is that all right? Okay, okay. So this is story time with Pastor West, you know. So you know you want to settle in. You want to get comfortable, okay? And for some of you to take in the story, you got to close your eyes. That's okay. Just don't fall asleep. All right, don't fall asleep. Okay, but just get co- get cozy, all right. Get cozy, and uh, and and I'll read this story to you. There you go. That's right. Couples are gonna cuddle up together. Watch what you do. No PDA. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> all right. Okay. So so this story it, it's I've I've uh, I've given it the title, problem at the party. Oh, and I'm old. <laughs> I gotta get my reading glasses on. All right. All right, here we go. You guys ready? Okay. It always starts with the best of intentions. Let's get the family together again. It's been too long. We, we miss each other. And it's the holidays. It always starts with the best intentions. And so we began preparing for the party. Weeks beforehand, the host stepped into overtime to make sure the place was clean and inviting and all the guests had enough to eat. We just wanted everyone to have a good time together. But this, of course, is not what we were really worried about. You see, there were rifts, unhealed wounds, and a fire smoldering just beneath the surface, a fire that just might break out again. Yes, we were excited, but we were anxious too. I only hope no one says the wrong thing. I wonder, is everyone coming? And are they really going to invite them all? It really would be easier if certain people just happened to be busy that day. (laughs) Maybe we could say that the invitation got lost in the mail. Denara, yeah. You've got to plan carefully, or else all the good intentions and green bean casserole in the world won't make any difference. The guns will start blazing. There will be casualties around the table. And this, sad to say, is exactly what happened. It started off well enough. People took off their jackets and made themselves at home. Light conversation was shared. The food and drink was delicious. Things were going well. But when we finally made our way to the table, it looked as if we just might pull the whole thing off. But then it happened. And all hell broke loose. It wasn't exactly what was said, but how it was said and what wasn't said. It was his turn of phrase, 
and his tone of voice. And then the back and forth started and the dam broke. There were raised voices. And everything we tried so hard to keep locked up and buried boiled to the surface. I mean, it all came out. Lines were drawn, sides were taken. It's sad because it happened right there, right in the middle of holiday dinner. It was going so great, and then it wasn't. And then there was that awkward moment when no one knows what to say, and so we all just went home, worrying about what would happen next. The aftermath of the incident, that's the worst. You don't really know the extent of the damage until days or weeks later, because it's only after some time that you get a sense of how deep the wounds go that were inflicted. Calls were made. Different versions of the story were told. Everyone had a different memory of the events and who was to blame. All everyone can agree on is that it's just too bad. It didn't have to happen that way. Things were looking so good. We really were hopeful. Now, if you ask Matthew how he remembers it going down, he really does try to be fair. Matthew, he's one of those disciples that strives to be as objective and impartial as possible. And unsurprisingly, he doesn't go into much detail. It happened in the town of Bethany, Matthew says. It was at Simon's house. There was a woman. Matthew never gave her name. She came in during the middle of the party and she anointed Jesus. The ointment she used was expensive and the disciples, well, they were disappointed because it was worth a lot of money and it was all just wasted on Jesus. It was money that could have been used for more practical purposes. And Matthew tells us Jesus, well, he didn't agree. He sided with the woman and defended her. Why do you trouble the woman? He said, she has done a beautiful thing to me. You always have the poor with you, but you don't always have me. It was a teaching moment. Yeah, that's what it was. We've all got something to learn when the party goes sour. We should be honest. Everybody had a part to play. Now, if you ask Mark what happened, He, for the most part, agrees with Matthew. The only thing that Mark mentions that Matthew didn't was the disciples really were pretty angry with this woman. It wasn't just a teaching moment for them. They scolded her, says Mark. And Jesus, well, Jesus wasn't exactly calm either. As Mark remembers it, Jesus said directly to them, leave her alone. It was surprising to see the rabbi behave this way to his own students. But Jesus has his reasons, and it's pretty clear that this woman and what she did was really important to him. Mark remembers Jesus saying something he had never said before. And truly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. What did he see in that woman anyway? Funny thing is, if you ask Luke what happened, he opens up a lot more. And honestly, he remembers things quite a bit differently than Mark and Matthew. Luke agrees with them that it happened in Simon's house, but he wants us to know that Simon was a Pharisee and that played into how things went down around the table. You see, the woman who broke into the room, well, she wasn't just any woman. Luke calls her a sinner. Now, the fact that Luke mentions that she's a sinner is important because Luke isn't the kind of person to hide other people's faults, to highlight other people's faults. Luke actually goes out of his way to hide them. So if Luke says this woman was a sinner, it really must have been something unsavory. She was doing things that, well, things we don't talk about in polite company. 
But Luke also really wants us to understand that when this woman came into the room, she was in tears. She actually threw herself at Jesus' feet and began wiping them with her hair. Everyone around the table was shocked. I mean, this isn't the kind of behavior that people do at parties. And yet Luke, good old Luke, really wants us to understand that her tears flowed from a place of love and that Jesus saw this too. Now Luke never even mentioned that the disciples' disappointment about the wasted ointment, what the disciples thought about her didn't matter to him at all. What mattered was the response of the man at the head of the table, Simon, the Pharisee. Luke says Simon was offended by the woman and the woman, and he was disappointed in the way that Jesus responded to her. I mean, if Jesus is who he says he is, he would know what kind of woman this is and he wouldn't let her touch him like that, let alone rub her face and her hair and her tears all over him. He had no idea where that woman had been. What Luke remembers is Jesus turning to Simon and telling him a story about two people in debt being forgiven and the one being forgiven much, loving much. And then, then Luke says, Jesus started to put Simon in his place. You didn't anoint me, said the master. You did not embrace me with a kiss. But this woman, she has poured all of her love upon me. So her sins, though many, are forgiven. As Luke remembers, the whole party ended in awkward silence. That is, except for Jesus and that woman. After Jesus publicly defended her by setting the host in his place, he took her in his arms and he looked into her eyes and said, Your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. And she did leave in peace. The whole thing was a rough affair. No doubt about that. And Jesus won't be invited back into that house. But for that woman, for that woman, it was a new beginning. So if you stand back, And you put Matthew and Mark and Luke's account together, a pretty clear picture of the story surfaces. Everyone's version is a little bit different, but all the pieces more or less come together. A woman bursts into the room and showers Jesus with great love, and the disciples judge her for her wastefulness, and Simon judges her for her sins, and Jesus defends the woman against them both. Then you talk to John. And John's account of the events, well, John adds a whole new light on all of it. I mean, John is pretty much the opposite of Matthew. He lets us in on all the dark secrets of those seated around that table. It's John's testimony that breaks the whole thing wide open. Now, John agrees with everyone that the party was in Bethany and they were all around the table. But John mentions that there were other people there too, people that Matthew and Mark and Luke failed to mention. John tells us that Lazarus was there. You know, Lazarus, the guy that Jesus had just raised from the dead, he was there at the table. And not only Lazarus, but his sister, his sisters, Mary and Martha. You remember those two, right? The ones that had the spat earlier about serving or listening? They were there. Simon was at the head of the table and all of the disciples and Jesus were sitting around it. Martha was serving everyone still. Good old Martha, always making sure that everyone's being taken care of. But that's when things get a little crazy. 
You see, John tells us exactly who the woman was who burst into the room causing the scene. The woman who poured out all that expensive ointment on Jesus and fell at his feet, washing them with her tears and drying them with her hair. John tells us that this woman, this sinner, get this, this woman was Mary. Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. You see, when Simon chose to throw the party for Jesus, he, of course, invited him and the disciples and Lazarus, the man of the hour, and his faithful sister, Martha. But there was someone who wasn't invited to the party. Someone we all know makes things difficult. Martha's sister, Mary. She... She's the black sheep of the family and something of a black spot on the community. Mary's the one we don't really talk about. She wasn't supposed to be there. But you see, she burst into the room anyway after it had started and was well on its way. And right there in the middle of dinner, she pushes her way to the center. She takes a jar of expensive ointment. She breaks it open and begins to wash Jesus' feet with her tears and dry them with her hair. John says the ointment was so strong, it filled the entire house. I mean, you couldn't ignore it. I guess we can now understand why Simon was so upset. He did everything he could to keep the party respectable. And that's why Mary wasn't supposed to be there. And then she pushes herself into the middle of everything, causing a scene right there. And that's not all. John tells us exactly which disciple it was who got so angry with her. Remember that Matthew simply said the disciples got angry. Now, this is true enough, but it's a safe description of the events, to say the least. And Mark, funny thing is, Mark doesn't even tell us that. He just said, there were some. You know, there were some who weren't exactly happy with this woman and her show. But John, John isn't afraid to air the dirty laundry. John lets us in on this little detail the disciple who tried to set Mary straight, that was Judas. It was Judas who called her out for her wastefulness. It was Judas who tried to put a stop to the whole thing. It was Judas who tried to save the party. And that isn't all. Get this. John adds a little detail. Judas was Simon's Son, Simon, the host, the one who called the whole party together, the one seated at the head of the table in honor, that was Judas's father. I'm not sure if you're connecting all the dots here, but John just let us in on the news that Simon the Pharisee, the host who is graciously trying to honor Jesus and who sought to protect him from exposure to this woman, Simon, who was in turn scolded by Jesus for not loving him like her, that Simon was Judas's father. And that isn't all. When Judas tried to defend his father's honor and set things back in order, when he tried to get this sinner and her crazy antics out of the limelight and make things right, Jesus, his rabbi, his friend, turn on him. Leave her alone, Jesus said. Judas was publicly reprimanded after only trying to defend the honor of his father and his house on this special occasion. Are you fitting all the pieces together? Well, we aren't finished. This blow up and Jesus putting Simon and Judas in their places, in their own home, this happened only three days before Judas would betray Jesus. Remember, it's the aftermath that's the worst. For it's there that you see how deep the wounds go. 
and the wounds, they were deep. Yes, Judas was greedy. Yes, it was more than likely he was never fully on board with this Jesus is the Messiah thing. But there was more. Something set him over the edge. Something finally made him pull the trigger. And it was this. Jesus had turned on his family. He interfered in personal affairs and publicly corrected Judas' own father right there in front of everyone. He questioned his father's hospitality. He questioned his love right there in his own home. And he defended that woman who could not help but make herself a scene in front of everyone. And then when Judas tried to make things right, Jesus turned on him. Leave her alone, he barked. Judas had spent years following Jesus, serving Jesus, sitting at the feet of Jesus. Like the elder brother in Jesus' own favorite story, Judas had worked and slaved and never once asked for a party in his name. But then this Mary comes along, who spent her life doing shameful things, wasting her family's inheritance on this precious ointment, disgracing everyone with her presence. She bursts into the party and brings shame on everyone. Of course, Judas was not surprised at that. Mary, she's all emotion. She's all display. She's forever absorbed in her own problems and issues. What burns Judas is that Jesus would not only let this happen, he would not only correct his father when he tried to make things right, but then he ices the cake. Wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Judas never once was given such an accolade. Nor was Peter or John or any of the other disciples. You know, Jesus tells us wonderful words about love and forgiveness and grace and mercy. And all that's fine. But then he starts meddling in family affairs. He interferes in matters between brothers and sisters and fathers and daughters. I mean, who does he think he is? And who wouldn't be angry? who wouldn't feel betrayed. Yes, Judas was a betrayer. In a matter of days, he would lead the soldiers to arrest Jesus. But betrayers do such things because they themselves have felt betrayed. I am of the opinion that when Judas snuck away to conspire with those temple leaders for Jesus' capture, and he took those 40 pieces of silver from their hands and plunged them into his pockets, when he led the soldiers into the garden to place a kiss of betrayal upon the cheek of his teacher and friend, there were certain words circling about his head, words that became more and more twisted as they turned, words that he heard in Jesus' own voice. You leave her alone. I tell you this story today amidst this joyful Christmas season because it's a story not only about a certain family in Bethany many years ago, but a story about every family and every table and every home that Jesus enters. Jesus comes into our homes and he comes speaking blessing, peace and hope and joy and love. But he also says, I come with a sword. And when the kingdom of God enters into our lives, divisions must arise. You know, the heart of Jesus is to be at home in our homes, to be a part of our families and our gatherings, to have a seat at our table. But nowhere, absolutely nowhere, does he promise to keep silent. Never does he take up a policy of non-interference. Jesus never lets 
sleeping dogs lie. When he enters into our homes and begins this work of restoration, there are sides that must be taken. There is truth that must be spoken, even when it hurts. And why is this? Because true peace, true joy, true love, true family doesn't come through fake surface agreeableness, which only conceals our mutual contempt. True restoration requires truth and sacrifice, even the greatest sacrifices of all. We often declare that Jesus hung on the cross for the sins of the world. This is true. And we add that he hangs on the cross for you and me individually. Even if you were the only one who had sinned, who had ever acted scandalously or held back an invitation or stood in judgment over someone else, even if you were the only one who had turned your back and walked away, he still would have sought you out. He still would have died for you. Yes. But is that all? I wonder. As Jesus hung on that cross, knowing that it was Judas who led him there, I wonder if it wasn't only the sins of the world or my sins or your sins that were on his mind. I wonder if he was also thinking about a certain family in Bethany and a woman who wasn't invited to a party, and of those who tried to keep her away so we could all just pretend for a moment that we didn't have problems. I wonder if he was thinking about whether his hanging and dying here out of love might change their hearts. That maybe how he died would make some difference in the way that Simon and Judas and Mary and all those around the table would love each other. Maybe if they remember that he died for them, maybe they would begin to make that difficult road to peace. Wasn't it John who said, greater love had no man than he laid down his life for his friends? And this makes me wonder, if he was thinking and praying and dying for them, maybe, just maybe, he was doing the same for our homes and those gathered around our tables too. Maybe he was dying for your Simon, the provider who sits at your feast at the head of your table. And maybe for the Judas in your home who tries desperately to keep things respectable and who cannot help but feel betrayed when family doesn't behave. And perhaps he was also praying for your Martha. Poor Martha, who works and works and works, hoping that things might be better this year. And also for Mary, lovely Mary, who simply can't help but make a scene. Maybe, just maybe, he died for all those around your table, too, hoping that they might also find a road to peace. I know, it's a crazy dream, right? I mean, our family's healed. I mean, God himself would have to come down and... You get my point, don't you? Lord, we come to this time in our service where we gather around your table. And we break bread and we remember that you were broken for us. 
that you poured out your life for us. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters here in this place right now, in this room. I pray that they not only come to the table themselves, but they bring with them the people that belong to them, the people that sit around their table, the Simons and the Judases and the Marthas and the Marys, that they remember that you died for them too, that you came to take a seat at each one of our tables, and that you came to bring peace and that you gave everything so that we could be healed. I thank you, Lord, for this love that surpasses all of our understandings and yet is so simple that it emerges and interrupts family dinner. And I pray in this season that you would make yourself known right there in the middle of the mess. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Savior, Savior and King. Amen. Amen. Amen.